Hi friends, I'm Lauren. And I'm Katie, and welcome to OK, But Did You Know? A podcast where we talk about the TV and media that we love with a friend who's never seen it before. Today we're recapping and chatting about Once Upon a Time, episode 112, Skin Deep. This episode aired on February 12th, 2012. It was directed by Milan Shalov, I think is how you say his name. They did say it in the commentary. I've already forgotten what the pronunciation is. Uh, and it was written by Jane Espenson. So before we get into our very chaotic talking, this week is going to be great. Uh, let's go over a little bit of a synopsis for the episode. In the Enchanted Forest, when asked for help in the Ogre's War, Rumpelstiltskin is all too happy to oblige for a price. He will help Maurice in return for his daughter, Belle. She agrees and becomes his maid, serving his meals and cleaning his castle. In an attempt to better get to know him, she stumbles upon the evil queen while running an errand. Regina tells her that any curse can be broken with true love's kiss. Belle attempts this, hoping to break him free of the curse of the Dark One. But Rumpel is not too keen to let go of his power, and as retaliation, casts Belle out of the castle for good. Because to him, no one will ever truly love him. And in Storybrooke, it's Valentine's Day, and things are not going as planned. The florist's van is repossessed due to a defaulted loan, Mary Margaret and David's relationship must stay under wraps, and even Ashley's relationship with Sean isn't working the way they'd hoped. Ruby convinces them all to go out on a girls' night that ends in a happy proposal for the young couple, and leaves Mary Margaret to wonder how her relationship can move forward. And after something is stolen from Mr. Gold, he retaliates against the florist who stole something precious to him, only to be arrested for kidnapping and assault. However, we see this was all a part of Regina's master plan to have a chat with Mr. Gold and learn how much he really knows, revealing him to be awake and fully knowing he is Rumpelstiltskin. <laughs> so we've already discussed multiple times, Beauty and the Beast is my favorite fairy tale. Oh, yeah. It has a very, very wonderful place in my heart, and I mm -hmm. cried <laughs> through this episode. <laughs> Like, I didn't even mind that it that it was Rumpel. No, I know. Because I, I know you had said that you really want, like, you would only accept it if it was a big, tall, hairy man. But he does work for this. Hey, yeah, no. I was saying, before we get into our chaotic notes, do you want to start with the international titles? Because I know you were excited for those. <gasps> yes, please. Okay. So, when translating, you know, the episode titles into languages that aren't English, they're not always going to have the most direct translations. Usually, the translation will mean something that is close enough to the title or it'll be some other deeper meaning within the episode you look so excited it's my favorite i i, I told you before i think that i i would watch this movie in french like the mm -hmm. original cartoon i used to love to watch it but i would i would change the language to french because it helped me learn french that's good so i didn't put write down what language translated to what but the most common translations uh were you know plain surface because the episode is called skin deep so it's you know not not very deep so plain surface, the surface and the deep, uh, some were just translated to bell, uh, and superficiality was another one. However, mm -hmm. two languages had the same translation, uh, German and French. I'm not going to try and pronounce the French, but I can pronounce the German, and I think you'll know what it is that I'm saying. Because in German, it was translated to das Beast und die Schon. Ooh, send me the French. I might be able to say it. I'll try and say it in French because okay. I'm missing some. I'm, I'm missing some accents here. It's not. It's gonna be missing things. La belle et la bête. Okay, but you said it's la la belle à la tête. Et la bête, I think is what it says. À la bête. Okay. Do you know what that translates to? Um, I don't remember what bête means because belle is beautiful. Yes. Um, but I. For some odd reason, I have uh, a la tête in my head because you, you said a oh. la bête. So now I have alouette stuck in my head. Ah, uh, okay. The the more or less direct translation for both of those is Beauty and the Beast. That's better. <laughs> yeah. Like they were going pretty literal with the way that they were uh, the way that they were translating I the title. I love it so much. Oh, I think it, I think it works, especially for the French episode, for the French translation of it. I think that makes perfect sense. It makes yeah, it makes perfect sense. Alrighty, so do we want to start with your notes because um, this is your favorite. This is my favorite. This was one that was um, it was accompanied with some audio commentary. So you probably have a lot, but I also have my double than normal because I have my initial viewing as well as stuff I pulled out from the uh, the audio commentary. So I have quite a bit. <laughs> 
I can't wait to hear your opinion of it too because I know you don't like Rumpelstiltskin. I I did write that down in my notes. Like I'm very cognizant of um how I'm scoring these earlier episodes. I'm trying to not let what I know sour things because I did write down that in the case of this episode, I can see where the ship of Rumpel and Bell comes from if you mm-hmm. only use this episode. I know far too much. Mm-hmm. But in this episode alone, he doesn't annoy me the way he annoys me in other episodes. So, I feel like he's more humanized. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, so <laughs> all of Gaston, like that, all <laughs> just the entirety. He's so pointless. <laughs> he's so pointless. <laughs> like I actually got excited when he gets turned into the rose or whatever. I'm just uh-huh. kind of sitting there, like, okay, fair. <laughs> I always laugh at how quickly he's bested. He's got this whole speech planned and Rumple just snaps his fingers and he turns into a rose. I laughed a lot at the Mr. French. Mm-hmm. Like they really went very literal with this episode. And I was they like, did. y'all really named him Mr. French. Yeah, they weren't thinking that hard. His name is Mo. Mo French? Yeah, as like, you know, instead of Maurice, Mo. Because why not? Mo French uh-huh oh my god but okay but speaking of uh of mr french the florist did you catch the name of the uh the florist on the side of his truck i did not so i put on our notes because i got very excited there's a pun in my episode so ha the uh the florist is named game of thorns which is a reference to jane espenson the writer of the episode because she co-wrote an episode of game of thrones <laughs> game of Th- Oh, no. I was saying, I want a sweatshirt now. That's just Game of Thorns. I need it. <laughs> I'm shocked that there isn't one. She said in the commentary she was hesitant to put that to write that because she's like, you know, it's kind of bad form to put references to the writer and things. But she's like, no, I couldn't think of a better name. So let's just go with it. I love that. I literally need like a like a hoodie that's got Game of Thorns on it with like with with, with roses like. It's a great I need name. Someone to make this for me. <laughs> it's <laughs> it is imperative. I'm sure it exists somewhere on Etsy or Redbubble. Someone's made oh, it. Oh yeah. So I laughed quite a bit too when uh Mr. Gold's house is seen open and someone calls and her uh Emma and Mr. Gold are just pointing their guns at each other, even though they know they don't <laughs> have to anymore. And I'm like, Yep. Why are you still pointing your guns at each other? You can put them down now. Like, for a good solid minute, they're just still at each other. And I'm like, what are you guys doing? Mm Mm-hmm. I did cry. I'm sorry. I'm dealing with this whole thing of, like, I really... Because, of course, like, we just talked about how Gaston gets turned into the flower, but him walking in going, oh, it's just the old woman selling flowers. I'm just sitting here like, that's an homage to the original story and i'm just sitting here like okay look i have a uterus i'm not okay right now um it is a reference to beauty and the beast (laughs) it made me so happy yeah the costumes her dress Mm -hmm. not the first dress it was okay and i was like let her change and then she finally changed and that dress Mm -hmm. it's perfect Eduardo Castro, is, we've already, we said already, he's a phenomenal uh, costume designer. There's actually a special on the DVDs that they show costume designing, and they do it through Belle. Like, like they, they use uh, her blue outfit, like that they go through the process of creating that. Um, I he, need it. They do a very good job of paying homage to the original uh, costume designs from the cartoons. The yellow dress sadly does come back. We do see that again. Um, but we do see a lot more of the, uh, of the blue dress because, I mean, oh, this is God. once upon a time. Just because you saw the end of someone's story here does not mean this is the end of them. So we will go back in time and see more of the two of them together in the okay. interim time. Because she does, I said this to you before, that my timeline does not align with something that she says. She says that it's yes. been a few months. Not possible. It's a couple of years that she's there. So she just has her time wrong. <laughs> she's just got her time wrong. But this was something, oh, I wish I'd, I wish I'd marked the page on the, on the book that I was reading last night. Uh, now is not the time to panic. Uh, there's like a line in there that like sometimes when you really love something you can't look too closely into how it was made or else it'll ruin it and I'm just like what is my life I mean it's kind of what we do yeah but um, so she says it's a few months it's a couple of years so there'll be time for them to jump back into the interim time between when she gets there and when everything else happens I have a I have a question for you I might have an answer are affairs just normal in Storybrooke? I mean, 
not really why why are we asking this because Ru- ruby's just like i mean go hang out with those guys okay but my husband like my boyfriend's at work yeah and like this isn't that's not don't do that yeah but it's ruby so like we're like it's fine to be fair though i think i think the uh the, the, the bar scene i really do think is where the fandom decision that ruby was bisexual just started i'm okay with this like as a fandom we just decided this i did like i'm gonna continue to tell you that i cried because him choosing his power over like actually knowing it's true love because it did mm-hmm. start to the true love's kiss and everything did start to change him knowing yep. for a fact it's true love and he's still like nope my power is still more important and knowing just how much he he loved her because mr gold beats a man for a cup apparently filming that uh he went at about 50 percent intensity because he thought that going at 100 percent intensity would be too scary that was only 50 percent that was only 50 percent effort on robert carlyle's uh standpoint so uh i wouldn't want to be stuck with him in a back alley unless i was uh, on his side oh yeah uh okay that's uh-huh. terrifying oh my um that <laughs> i think that hurt my brain a little bit my favorite line my favorite line of the okay. entire show. Bring me back a cone. <laughs> that whole scene. That whole scene. I, I also commented on that whole scene with the pastrami sandwich. And they also comment on the uh, comment on it in the commentary. Jen Espenson called it very Espensonian writing style to just stop everything to talk about a sandwich. That makes sense. Yeah. Just like, let's just talk about. But she's not wrong, though, in that talking about food, especially in his whole thing of bring me back a cone. It humanizes people in in times where you really need it and i think in that moment right before you have your very evil villainy super villainy standoff you need to be reminded Mm -hmm. that he is still a person and just regina is very very evil witch or evil queen i'm sorry very very evil queen within this because one dangling henry in front of emma to get her out of the room i'm just like that's just wrong that's oh absolutely i mean i know you love your son but you're using him and then everything she did in Fantasyland, uh, when it comes to, I'm just calling it Fantasyland. Yeah, it's fine. I, I should, it's your reaction to it. It makes me happy. When you say everything in Fantasyland, I'm just my my brain just goes back to the the scene between her and Belle. Oh yeah, that's what I meant. Is because it's oh. so much chaos. Regina in the in this episode is like in in the Enchanted Forest is so so chaotic, and it's. The scene between her and Belle was originally supposed to happen inside the carriage, but it wasn't until they oh. got to filming that they realized that um, the carriage is not big enough for two people with big dresses and cameras. It is, in fact, mm. a one-person carriage. I don't think we ever see the inside of it. Ever. That makes to sense. To my knowledge. I don't think there's enough room for Regina and the Enchanted Forest stuff and a camera. So, but it's just, it's the way she just rolls up and she just, she just, I mean, she clearly knows who Belle, Belle is. There's, there's, yeah, she knows what she's doing. But it's just, it's the badassery of just like, did my carrot splash you? Oh no, I'm, I'm fine. You know, I'm tired of riding. Let me stretch my legs and walk with you for a spell. And then she just keeps going. <laughs> you carry very little. I don't want to be slowed down. Oh, you're running from someone. The question is, master or lover? Oh, master and lover. You know, I might take a wrist. Y- you go on ahead. So if I'm right, you love your employer, but you're leaving him. I might love him. I mean, I could, except something evil has taken root in him. Sounds like a curse to me. And all curses can be broken. A kiss born of true love would do it. Oh, child, no. I would never suggest young woman to kiss the man who held her captive. (laughs) What kind of message is that? (laughs) Besides, if he loves you, he would have let you go. And if he doesn't love you, well then... The kiss won't even work. But he did let me go. Yes, but no kiss happened. And a kiss... A kiss is enough? He'd be a man again? An ordinary man. True love's kiss will break any curse. (laughs) You were excited for that. I love that one (laughs) so much so. Because I don't think I've done any that actually require accents on the podcast yet. Well, I mean, the line, though, all curses can be broken. That whole moment I'm sitting here and I'm like, 
So wait, if you kiss Emma, does this end everything? No, actually, no. there is very much. No, there's very much actually. Uh, spe- there's a specific uh, way the curse can be broken, and this is ah. a case where like it's not arbitrary. I actually do agree with it. Oh, okay. I'm just laughing because you just have that moment of the people who like you know Swan Queen of like just just kiss. Well, it it does it does garner the question. Snow and Snow and Charming have kissed. Mm-hmm. Didn't break the curse. They are true love. Curse is still active. Well, does it need to do something with the peop- the person that's, that that cast the curse? No, not necessarily. I know so little. <laughs> I know. I'm trying. Well, okay, what's what's really funny that you're asking me this now? Because in mm-hmm. two episodes is like when the show was airing. After episode 14 is where um, the the Paley Fest event that I use for a lot of stuff uh, happened. Yeah. So the the moderator asked by then. You know, we've seen, you know, Mary Margaret and David kissing. So, you know, clearly there's something that breaks the curse. But like, what, like, are you going to start dropping hints of what it is? And one of the creators went, perhaps we already have at by that point, which looking back on it, yes, they have. But it was the through line joke of like uh, people had been picking up on a lot of things. So someone had already figured out who a certain character was. And after he dropped that, no, perhaps we already have. He went blog about that tonight. People tell me we're not moving story forward fast enough. <laughs> I foresee myself uh, using the lovely the whole time audio eventually mm-hmm. for something pertaining to this freaking show. Yeah. <laughs> the whole time. The whole time. The whole time. <laughs> that will be you when we watch the episode where the curse breaks. That will be me. For sure. Oh, yeah. I have two more things I think I want to talk about. One being, she said mermaid. She said mermaid. She did say mermaid, and I will just, this is not a spoiler. Ariel does show up, but yay! Whatever they were planning here gets next. Because I don't even know if they were planning it or if they literally just decided to just throw it in there as a fun thing. Because again, at the Paley Center thing, there was the around that one line was three instances of me going, well, you know the future? There's irony everywhere. <laughs> because so many comments got made in relation to that that did or did not happen. And it was just, it's too funny. But I can't tell you anything because Errol doesn't show up for a little while. Okay, actually, it is actually still two more things. Um, I forgot a thing. It's fine. I knew Rumpel knew that Mr. Gold, he knows, and she figured it out. Now they both he know. Knows. And <laughs> I'm just sitting here like, what? Like, and the way she corners him to get it figured out just to make sure, because we know she knows, now we know he knows, and I'm just sitting here like, who else knows? I'm not going to say anything. Oh my god. No, not, um, not saying anything. And my last two, like, notes was, no, 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 she can't be dead, and then just going, she's not dead, holy shit! <laughs> she is not dead, and this was another thing that came up in the commentary that, I think it was Jen Espenson that said this, the fact that he believes her without any proof says a lot about how he views the world and what he expects from it. Oh, that's true. Well, after everything that's happened, yeah. He doesn't even think to check in on this or anything like that. He just goes right into depressive mode. But no, those were my last lines, really. The the mm-hmm. the things that tended to make me cry were, you know, a cup. Because it's chip. The chipped cup. The chipped cup. But, I mean, beating a man... Half to death yeah. over a, a cup. Well, it's an important cup. It is an important cup, but Mr. Gold needs to work on some emotional maturity. Well, yeah. You'd think after 300 <laughs> years he'd, he'd have, or 200 years, you'd think he'd have that, but no. But no. So the first thing, because as we, we've, we know, I, I take a lot of notes and then highlight the ones that are important to say later, because not, not all of them are gems. I just wrote uh i wrote down her, her line of no one decides my fate but me which is a great line oh yeah very bell of her um this beast so subtle although i do love rumpelstiltskin's pretending to be shocked face yeah so in the scene in granny to the very beginning uh when um, mary margaret and david are talking and ruby's like when we push the tables together like no 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 we're fine um david's reading a copy of anna karenina which is mm-hmm. just really funny because he says, you know, I can't wait to see how it ends. It's a book about an affair that goes badly, as his affair is going badly. 
Oh, yeah, I think I even wrote at some point, um, just stop cheating. Yeah. I tell your wife that you're not happy. Like, why are we doing this still? Because he's afraid of hurting people and therefore hurts everyone by accident. He's indecisive. That's the thing That's... that he's missing from, like, his from, like his real personality is, like, the leadership and the decisiveness and the ability to, like, actually kind of stick to mm-hmm. some kind of moral center. He's missing that, which is what's causing his kind of inner turmoil right now. Gotcha. At first, my brain just went, yeah, sounds like a man. I should stop that. <laughs> I don't like hurting people, so I had to make dumb decisions. Pretty much. So in um, the Dark One's castle, in that big room, there's a whole lot of stuff in there. Oh, yeah. So I'm sure there's a list somewhere of everything that's in the room. I did my best to clock as much as I could. So you can see suits of armor. You can see Mm -hmm. a candelabra and a clock, which are meant to represent Lumiere and Cogsworth. Uh, You can see Cupid's bow. You can see uh, something that's meant to be uh, the Golden Fleece from Greek mythology. Uh, Obviously his spinning wheel. Yeah. Obviously his spinning wheel, which is, you know, in the main room anyway. The very back corner. You can see the puppets uh, again from 105. He really likes those puppets for some particular reason. Uh, There is a sorcerer's hat, which apparently in the script just said wizard's hat. And the, the, you know, design production team just took that and ran with it. Um, Unfortunately for us, that's a little bit of a plot hole, but that's for another day. (laughs) And then additionally... Uh, the sword is meant to be Excalibur and the cup that he, the, the, the chalice that he takes off to, uh, put the, the cup in its place is meant to be the Holy Grail. Again, that gets, you know, the actual Excalibur and Holy Grail get retconned later on in the show. So it's there. It's a fun, but this is season one. So this is interesting. He's got a lot of stuff. He's a collector. I didn't expect any Arthurian things, but okay. Yeah. Because, you know, a lot of the show, it's fairy tales, but it's also, I mean, it's, it's it's fairy tales, classic literature, fantastical tales of any kind. So. That's um, fair. Yeah. Again, in the scene, like you mentioned with um, them pointing the guns at each other, his line of, assuming I don't find him, and then he cuts himself off. Like, my dude, you are not subtle. <laughs> at all. Not at all. He's angry. Mm-hmm. And then I don't know if you noticed this in the um, in the pharmacy scene, Mr. Gold is buying rope and duct tape. I did notice that my true like, crime self went, "Uh oh, <laughs> my dude, you are not subtle." I don't think he was trying to be. No, he's not. But also, like he was he's Mr. Gold. He, he thinks he thinks <laughs> he he's was invincible. fueled by rage. <laughs> he was fueled he was by very, rage. <laughs> very much fueled by rage. Again, in the bar scene, I wrote down Ruby and Mary Margaret look like proud lesbians watching their straight bestie. Yes, yes, they do. Which was, they were both very happy for her that she got engaged, but I'm just like, okay, now kiss. Yeah. They're very good. Unfortunately for us, they're just really good friends. Mary Margaret, I think is, Mary Margaret is what I say about Mary Margaret and Snow. She's very straight, but she is the type of straight person that she will be leading the pride parade. And I, I, she's that, she's the best kind of ally. Exactly. I need more queer characters, but I know I'm also like this is 2011. Yeah, I this isn't a spoiler. You won't see the fruition of this for a very long time. As I said before, the you know the, the fandom decided Ruby is bisexual. We are correct. Ooh, we are correct. I am very happy about that. But I cannot tell you when you get to see that reveal. It's an it's an. I don't care. Years. I don't care. It's it's uh making my bi self just very happy because mm-hmm. representation matters it's important exactly and I, I think the fandom was just like we're just very happy that we were right <laughs> it's like you like, like when they announced it we're like everyone's like wow that is brand new information how would we ever figure that out i don't know i think i think it's because we have eyes <laughs> <laughs> the scene outside when uh, david gives mary margaret the wrong uh the wrong valentine like the idiot that he is um when he jokingly says that you no, know, he didn't want her finding somebody else, and Mary Margaret goes like you, I'd never caught that line before. That's such a dig at him, like because she's already made up her mind that like what they're doing isn't healthy. Yeah, ish to a point, to a point. She's already made up made up her mind that they're, what they're doing isn't healthy. But it's that it's that line of like, well, I don't want you to find somebody else. She's like, like you, <laughs> like it's the shade behind it a little bit. What you said before, what you said before about um him kind of choosing power over 
uh, or over her really. That was originally the through line that um, they said in the commentary that like originally it was him actively choosing the power. Um, and it sort of shifted over the course of writing the episode where the through line kind of more became that he didn't really believe he was lovable. Um, mm-hmm. But I wrote down like when she when she calls him a coward, he is a coward. But then he says, my power means more to me than you. So there's that addict behavior that I say a lot. Oh, so, yeah. I like seeing my thoughts be like, oh, that's where I got that from. Mm-hmm. I like it was a little bit, it felt like it was a little bit of both, like him really actually like being like straight up, no, my power is more important. But at the same time, you could, he was even saying things like no one could ever love me. Like mm-hmm. that's not possible. And just having that. Exactly. Depressy of I'm unlovable. Exactly. So I'm actually going to flip my last two notes because I think one is going to make for a better last note before we switch into more discussion-y topics. Uh, the nurse the very at the very end uh, when we go down she to the scares asylum, me <laughs> she's meant to be resemble nurse ratchet from one flew over the cuckoo's nest what originally originally and i i really should have watched i think i might go back to the dvd and see if they've see if they've kept it this way um originally she's credited just as like disgruntled nurse even though it's very clear who she's meant to like resemble eventually someone literally does call her nurse ratchet so like they just decided that's who she is how did i not pinpoint that that is so cool. She's like a dead ringer for the whole yeah. movie. And she does such a good job with it. Wow. But Yeah. Well, the more you know. The more you know. My, <laughs> last, uh, my last note that I think this is a better one to end on is, remember when I told you about Spoon Queen? <laughs> oh, no. Did I, did I not realize... I don't know if you clocked it, but yeah, it's, this is, it's, it's the scene when she talks to Rumple in her castle. Um, and she just is licking the spoon very slowly. I'll have to find the gif and send it to you. <laughs> it makes it funnier because with Beauty and the Beast, every all of the inanimate objects are meant to be yeah. like, humanoid. Um, mm-hmm. So not in his it castle. has a whole nother... Not in his castle, but it has like another level to it by saying Spoon Queen. Now it, I'm sitting here like... It does. If it were actually like Beauty and the Beast, that would actually have been a person. Yeah. <laughs> but now you have context for spoon queen i do not need to read fan fiction i do not need to read this i don't i mean someone's free to correct me i don't think there is spoon queen fan fiction but you know i say that there was other ones that were you know what no i can't even say that anymore never mind no not not finishing that thought is it bad that ever since the Midas episode, I've been curious of any fan fiction of Midas? It probably exists. Because everything I no he idea. touches. <laughs> it, what is it? Rule, was it Rule 54 or something like that? Rule 34. 34. If you think it exists, it probably exists. Yeah. Spoon Queen. Oh so, my god. Spoon Queen. Spoon Queen. You're welcome. Thank, thank you to all of Once Upon a Time for that. <laughs> So this was the introduction of our bell. Um, bring us back onto uh, our discussion as as best we can here. While she is re- she is recurring for this season, um, we'll see her once again before the season is over. I do promise you that. And then she does come in as a main cast member going forward. So this is not the last we see of our bell French. I love her. She is delightful. Her the actor who plays her is uh, Emily De Robin. She is. An Australian actor. Um, people would most likely know her as Claire on Lost. She's one of our uh, our Lost alumni that come around, and she's one of the ones that sticks around for quite a while. It's gonna be really weird when I finally decide to watch Lost and go, "Hey, they're from Once Upon a Time." There's Constantly. so many of them. There's so <laughs> many of them. Like, because like a lot of them, some of them are people that come and stay for a while, and some some are like you know half season arc occurrences. Some people do end up being main cast. Most of them are like they showed up for like one episode of once upon a time probably just because their friends asked them to but they're like main characters on lost i'm just gonna have to watch lost and go hey guess who i saw today (laughs) (laughs) yep so something that came up in the commentary and i'll go through my commentary notes after this um because i think this is a good place to kind of start us on like a little bit of discussion uh so it's not again just me talking at you although i you you seem to enjoy that Mm. I love it. What are you talking about? (laughs) 
something that came up in the especially in the the first scene in Storybrooke uh out on out on Main Street is the dynamic between Rumple or the dynamic between Gold and Regina. Mm-hmm. Because this is a show that like most shows can't really handle multiple villains. And in the case of the show, they have really two two villains. And like the sh- as the show goes on, the structure changes completely. But in the case of this season, we really do have two main villains being Gold, Rumpelstiltskin, and Regina the Evil Queen. Um, and in a show that I say ends up being kind of overstuffed, in the case of these two characters, they are almost kind of working against each other. It's kind of cool. Yeah. Because they have two very different motives. Again, I know what Rumble's motive is. You don't. But they really are kind of working in opposition with each other towards two completely different goals. So not only do they have to fight against the heroes, they got to fight against each other, which just makes for a very interesting dynamic that I feel like you can't get on a lot of other shows. Well, it makes me think, okay, which of the two is technically stronger when you start really looking at it? Because Rumple is extremely powerful and extremely old, but then the evil queen, like, she did what she did. Everybody's stuck in modern time. So it's very interesting. Mm-hmm. And then, like, I'm waiting to see. I'm like, how angry is he at her? Or is it part of his plan for putting them all where they are? Yeah. So it's just waiting. <laughs> yes, waiting. It's Because, like, everything you're talking about, the answers are forthcoming. And especially with the scene at the end of the episode, which is, while it does at the surface look like kind of the same dynamic from the one we saw from 102, where it's him behind bars and her on the outside... The dynamic has almost flipped in a way because mm-hmm. in the first one, she's going to him for advice or she's going to him for something. And he he's kind of the one with the power because he knows where he needs to be. He knows that where he is is what's meant to happen is he needs to be in that cell when certain things happen. However, now in Storybrooke with the with the new dynamic, she's the one in power. She does still need the confirmation that he is who he that he you know knows who he is. But she's the one with the cup. She's the one with all of the power in the situation. And I like seeing that kind of flipped or to a sense. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's her curse. So yeah, what did that tip the balance of their dynamic? A little bit, I guess. It says a lot about their dynamic, and I think they also said this in the commentary that she can just walk into his house whenever she wants to. Oh my. Like, she just walked right... Like, despite the fact that he does keep the mirrors covered, and then that was a line, apparently, that got cut, a lot of my commentary notes are things that got cut, because we have the writer in it, oh. so she knows what was in it originally and what wasn't. Um, that when uh, Belle makes the comment about how he keeps the mirrors covered, because uh, he, you know, can't stand looking at himself or whatever, apparently he did say, like, there's other reasons to keep a mirror covered. But they took that out... Because at the end, we see him kind of take the the mm-hmm. tarp or whatever off of or the tapestry off of the mirror to talk to Regina, because they said they wanted to, they wanted to cut that out because it works without the it works without the line, but also you kind of give the audience the chance to kind of be smart if they fig- like feel smart if they figure it out sooner. Like, oh, clearly he's got that covered so that Regina can't spy on him. Like, exactly. I mean, that's what I thought. Yeah, exactly. It works on so many levels just to kind of cut that out, um, but to still have that re- the reveal still works without the context. Mm-hmm. but i just a lo- their dynamic is so fascinating <laughs> it's amazing it only gets more enmeshed and more entangled as time goes on for 500 different reasons i just love that everything's still so introductory right now and we're 12 episodes in it's all yeah. still very like like you said we don't re- i don't realize it that a lot more has actually happened but like it's still mm-hmm. so introductory and i'm still sitting here like give me more give me more because <laughs> I really can't wait for the next episode. <laughs> I know. You finally get to learn what happened to Frederick. <laughs> and who the fuck Frederick is. Also who Frederick is. No, you're right. But it's a, it's such a good first season. And we are. We're, we're just over halfway through. You know, it's 22 episodes. Yeah. So we're on episode. We just finished episode 12. So there's still f- so much to learn. I mean, there's more to learn as the show goes on because the structure of there being, you know, flashbacks that correlate with what's going on in the main storyline that continues. That's their main structure. Yeah. I don't. There's very few episodes that only follow one timeline. Oh. Like, even if it's not, like, Enchanted Forest and Storybrooke, sometimes it's, like, you know, stuff that happened during the curse in Storybrooke and regular Storybrooke or stuff that happened in other places. I'm just, I'm really excited because, you know, eventually when we do finish season one, getting to see how things change into season two because we both know, like, when it comes to TV, 
when you start getting into later seasons and start moving forward, dynamics change. The storyline is so much more in depth. And then, of course, you're so yeah. much more involved with all of the mm-hmm. characters. And yeah. so, like, I'm still falling in love with all these characters and, like, really starting yeah. to get to know them. You're sitting mm-hmm. here just getting to reminisce. Exactly. Which is Ugh. a good di- – I've always said this about our podcast is this is such a good dynamic because – Very often with recap podcasts, you're getting two people or multiple people that are all equally as obsessed about the thing that you're talking about. Yeah, which is a is 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 its own dynamic, and you will get the case of like you know this person pays more attention to this character, this person pays more attention to the set design, this person pays more attention to the dialogue. So you do have that different like obsessiveness, but to be able to watch this show through the eyes of both a seasoned viewer who who has to say to herself, I wrote in my notes twice. When you see the future, there's irony everywhere. Like when you've got mm-hmm. that and someone who's seeing this for the first time and learning about all these characters for the first time, it's such a new dynamic that I feel like is more, in- it's, it's not more interesting. It's interesting to hear for people that normally listen to recap podcasts about people at the mm-hmm. same level. It's just, it's a new way of consuming mm-hmm. media. Yeah. Cause also, like I said, with, with the, the depth of the notes that I'm taking um, to make sure that I can like have stuff that's both like, interesting to, to talk about as well as you know funny to listen, funny for me to say um i'm watching these episodes far more closely than i ever have before which is why i say if i find a new line or a, or a new something in episode 118 i don't know who i am anymore because i've watched that one so many times i understand that though because it's it's just like when i watch bobs and i'm sitting here and every mm-hmm. time i'm watching a new episode or like the new season coming out now i'll literally be sitting there going oh my God, I need Lauren to watch this. It'll just be three years. Like it's yeah. so knowing now watching it, knowing you get to see it one day and I get to talk mm-hmm. about it with you yep. is a whole nother, like just my casual viewing has changed of my favorite show yeah. because of this. And it's mm-hmm. so much fun. Yeah. I was thinking the other day about the the thing that I know that I have that's an unpopular opinion in the beginning of the second mm. season that I, I think I think you and I are going to disagree on. I keep thinking about it because I know where I come from with this idea and people that tend to disagree with me, you are more aligned with them, but I'm Mm. not a hundred percent certain if you're going to disagree with me because it depends on, it depends on a couple of factors. I can't say exactly what this is, but there's something, there's an opinion that I have that is not a very popular opinion, but I'm okay with that. I wrote at one point of this episode though, like in all caps, this episode is so good. Like I, I, (laughs) thoroughly enjoyed this oh i'm glad so do you want to hear uh the audio commentary notes that i took because like i said that i took twice as many notes so whoever's been listening to this episode um buckle up i'm sure you've seen how long it is because i i'm foreseeing this is going to be over 50 minutes i mean yeah it's beauty and the beast so because not, not only is it your favorite, it's your favorite fairy tale, but also it's an episode that had audio commentary. So therefore, I just have twice as much notes. <laughs> Which, coming from me, says something. That does say something. It's a rumple episode. Yeah. yeah. So this, the audio commentary of this episode was recorded by Robert Carlyle, who played Rumpel Stiltskin. Mm-hmm. Uh, for the purposes of saying things faster, um, they all call him Bobby. That's what I wrote in my notes. I'm going to call him Bobby. So Rumple is Bobby. Rumple is Bobby. Got it. It's faster that way because that's what I have in my notes. I love um, it. And so it was between him and Jane Espenson, who was the writer for this episode. Um, and I like the dynamic that they have about this. Like it's Ginny and Josh was the two of them flirting the entire time, which is always enjoyable. But in the case of this one, like you had the ma- the main focused actor and the person who wrote the episode. So like he's coming at things from his perspective and he's like telling her things that happened while they were filming and Jane Espenson is talking about the writing and all the stuff that that she put in the episode that got taken out. <laughs> because I mean, I think I wrote this in my notes like let's talk about the deleted moments. Like there's probably no more than there normally are because they write 60 minutes worth of content to cut it into 42 yeah. minutes. But because we've got the commentary direct from the writer, we know exactly what got cut out. Something that happened, and I, I, I love hearing this in the com- in the commentary because it just it makes me feel good about the cast and the set and like the dynamics, is how much they were gushing about the actors in the scenes that he wasn't in. Mm-hmm. Like they had their commentary is one of my favorite kinds of commentary where you actually can't hear the episode at all. Oh goodness! Like they, like with Ginny and Josh, they stopped enough to kind of hear the important things, 
these two just kept talking. Like at one point they comment on the music. We can't hear it because they're just talking. This is what I imagine watching a movie with each other is probably like. Probably. <laughs> but especially they were gushing so much about Ginny and Josh. And, like, and I think um, Bobby was talking about Josh more specifically because he'd worked with him uh, a little bit more at that point. Um, but they also uh, uh, were gushing so much about uh, Megan Ori, who plays Ruby or Red, um, mm-hmm. when she walks in that scene, because he was like, he was just saying, like, you know, not only is she, you know, a wonderful actor, she's just a wonderful person, which, like, you always like to hear that everyone's nice to each oh, other. Oh, yeah. Um, but she's a local hire. She was a Canadian hire, and um, she's one of the Vancouver actors. And uh, Jane, she's like, no, you always kind of take a risk on the Vancouver actors for characters that may sh- that may stick around for a little longer. But with like with her, like they just like she was just perfect. And they just they spend like a good couple of minutes just gushing about Megan Ori, and I'm like, this makes me so happy. Well, it's like you want you want the the favorite characters to be good people in real life yeah. as well, mm-hmm. yeah. but you also want everyone to be nice because if they're yeah. not nice. Casting changes happen. <laughs> yeah, that they do. I'm trying to think. I'm looking back at Charmed. I'm actually thinking there is someone in this episode who gets recast the next time we see them. Oh, what? Yeah. That's interesting. Next time we see Gaston, it's a different guy. I think that's okay. Yeah, considering this he guy didn't, didn't really have didn't a whole lot much. to do. Yeah, he didn't really... He got snapped. <laughs> he did. I'm sorry. <laughs> I just realized when they, when they were filming the scene where she cuts off the end. This is towards the bottom of my notes, but uh, the scene where she he gives her the rose and she cuts off the end. Apparently, in rehearsals, he kind of did like a kind of like a thing when she does that, or like he crossed his legs a little too hard. But he ultimately decided to not do that because he didn't want to detract from uh, Emily's speech. Gotcha. Oh man. He's like, the focus needs to be on her. I can't do this. So I'm like, but it's just funny that he thought that he thought about that. It checks out. Yeah, I would probably be thinking the same thing. Yeah. So our first thing that um, got cut out that they mentioned was there was a storyline behind the Golden Fleece. They were, he was going to tell her about it or something like, oh, come on. It's in the script. We don't believe we don't know what it is. But I need it. I know. I need it. It might be in the deleted scenes. It's been a while since I watched them. I love Greek mythology. Me too. So I sent you this um, because it was just too funny not to point out. Um, is They're talking about, um, it started with Bobby saying he was giving Eddie and Adam suggestions of what to put in the background of uh, either Mr. Gold's pawn shop or like on uh, the set dressing for Rumpel's castle. And he's like, he's like, like eh, maybe next year or in 10 years. And then they go on a little thing of like, and then Jane's, I wrote this down. <laughs> it's a direct quote. People listening to this commentary could be listening to this 10 years from now. Right now, we don't know if we get a season two. When you see the future, there's irony everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> see, now I need a hoodie that says that, too. What, when you see the future, there's irony everywhere? Yes. That's a Rumpelstiltskin quote from season two. <laughs> I know, I was saying, I need that on a hoodie, yeah. too. So I can't pinpoint exactly when they were recording this. If they don't know that they got a season two, they might have already finished writing season one based off of their filming schedule. Um, Because they tended to finish around March-ish, end of Mm -hmm. March. So figure April is probably when they would have found out if they got picked up, which would give them enough time probably to re to do any finishing touches on the um, on the finale. Should they not get picked up again? But we're from the future. We know they got seven seasons. So we're from the future. Yes, we are from the we're from the future. So a motif that got cut out of the episode uh, was there were going to be doves. That was going to be more of a thing. Okay. So she's supposed to get a dove uh, that would um, that would kind of get word that the war is won, and then she's supposed to run out of a door and then into a hallway that would go back into a door that would ultimately lead her back to that main room, kind of as like a reminder that there's kind of no way out for her, even though the even mm-hmm. though you know she wants to try and, and like basically she can't leave without his say so. But the whole dove motif was basically cut from the entire. It was cut from the entire episode. But um, the henchman that keeps following gold around and doing stuff for him, he's credited as the Dove. That's his name. Oh, that's interesting. So, it was planned, but they just, if, for a time, I guess certain things had to be cut out, especially if the episode got rewritten. As episodes tend to, I learned quite a bit about the structure of writing this show from this commentary. It felt like it made sense that they didn't have that in it, though, because even from the beginning, like the reason she's leaving is so that they can, because of the war right yeah. like that's why he was like mm-hmm. okay here's your deal but she comes with me 
So it makes sense yeah. that the war's ending. I think that was like a given. Maybe it wasn't needed yeah. as much, and so that's why it was cut. Mm -hmm. Well, again, with a lot of what they say about the stuff that gets cut out is that it works without it. And it very much does. Mm -hmm. So much of this episode, you would really have no idea that these things got cut out in the way that they were. They talked about kind of tightening things up. And at one point, Bobby goes, mostly it's my pauses that get pauses that get taken out, which just, you know, fed my soul as a po as a podcaster, because that's mostly what I cut out is like the gaps between our conversation when we're trying to find things. Same. We, we kind of just try and make it a little bit more compact. Yeah, just like, I'm just tighten up the screws, trying to make it, you know, a little bit, a little more cohesive as a conversation. But like so much of the episode, like the stuff that gets cut out, it's there's it's still there. Towards the very end, the thing that I say a lot uh, that I got from Jen Espenson from this commentary, and I confirmed this is where I got it from, was her calling some scenes bay leaf scenes or something like a bay leaf. Like you, you put it in the episode um, and you think it's going to be the heart of the episode, but ultimately you don't need it. You take it out, but there's still a flavor of it mm -hmm. left behind. I thought yeah. she was, I, I thought that when she mentioned that she was talking about a scene that got cut, but she was actually using that as an example for um, the scene between uh, Rumpel and Belle in the dungeon at the very end. It was mm -hmm. written completely differently. And then it got changed again in the rewrites by the showrunners, but that became the heart of the story. She says, the thing that you thought was the heart of the story that you thought you needed was a bay leaf. It was a little flavor element that you needed to get the script going. And at the end, you pull it out and you don't serve it. And sometimes it's the reverse. It's something you add at the end that ends up being the heart of the episode. Oh. Okay. I'm really inspired right now. <laughs> I love the way she talks about writing. Oh, it's amazing. She's just, I, I would love to pick her brain. It's just so cool. Maybe one day you will. Maybe one day. Uh, something else that got cut out of this was Emma just pops up at the cabin, right? Like... We don't really question how she got there. It's just, that's the trajectory. She's the she's the police. Yeah. She needs to, someone probably reported Mo missing or something like that. Um, but there was a whole scene. Apparently, um, Gold saw her outside the pharmacy and sent her on kind of a wild goose chase towards something else. That there was apparently a whole sequence of how she got from that that setup to something else. to, to That would send her down the path to actually find Gold. But the episode is long enough as it is. And there just wasn't enough room for kind of a C plot at that point. As long as it works. As long as it works. Exactly. Like everything they say, everything they say about the stuff that gets cut out is it works without it. And they're not mm -hmm. wrong. It all works without it. The episode I think works. This episode works really, really well as it stands. Um, they also commented that Cinderella, Snow White, and Red Riding Hood walking into a bar sounds like a joke. It sounds like the beginning of a joke. Oh my God. Also, how did I not see that? Because it's Storybrooke. You don't really see it as much. Exactly. You don't really think about it. But it really is the three. The, oh, my goodness. Yeah. And lastly, we can go into stats after this. Um, again, with the, with the scene with with Rumpel and Regina or Gold and Regina at the, in the jail cell at the end, Bobby goes on a long thing about how like two actors have to get on really well for that dynamic to work the way that it does. Mm -hmm. Like, in order, you have to, there has to be a a trust there, a trust in everything, not trying to outdo each other, but their dynamic works because they trust each other and they can kind of form formulate that dance that's needed to balance kind of the power dynamic really, really well. You're never quite sure who has the upper hand in which situation, who thinks mm -hmm. they have the upper hand in which situation and how it all really works. And like the two of them got on really well from the beginning, which really shows in the way that they play these characters. Oh yeah. I really enjoy just when they're on screen together. It's... Mm -hmm. You can tell it's two very, like, very good actors doing a yeah. very, very good job. Like, they have a connection. Yeah. yeah. In the Comic-Con that they did before the se the season aired, because they actually did, they went to San Diego Comic-Con right before the first season aired. Uh, they all did, like, their, like, red carpet or, like, their, whatever the carpet at San Diego Comic-Con, the hallway of people is. Um, and I think they asked, I don't even, the question had to have been, like, you know, why should viewers tune into Once Upon a Time? And it was lana and bobby who were paired together for the interviews and his response was just because lana pri is is in it and she's fucking brilliant that was his response oh <laughs> you like to see that i do all right so do we want to do some stats it's not gonna take very long i think i know what your score is but i would like to hear it anyway this is my first 30 yay <laughs> you sound so very happy excited. Oh, I, no, I am. I'm happy that you found a 30 because I was honestly, I was thinking you weren't going to in the first season. 
I was worried I wasn't going to, but then this mm-hmm. this episode broke my heart in all the go- in all the right ways. Yeah, no, but the nostalgia is also there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so which is perfectly reasonable. Yeah, this because like because I don't have any thirties for Bob's yet. Yet I'm sure I'm sure there will be one coming, but I, I still don't have any. I hope so. They're coming, I'm sure. But I'm very happy that you found your uh, your thirty. And like I said, I try to not let what I know about these characters, mm-hmm. especially Rumpel, um, sway the way that I'm uh, that I'm scoring these because it's not fair to who he is in this season because who he is in this season and who he is in the future are vastly different people because characters change and grow and sometimes mm-hmm. for the better, sometimes not so much. But um, this one I gave eights across the board, so it's got a twenty four out of thirty. Which is not bad. Um, so far, Price of Gold is still my lowest rated episode. I think it's like a twenty or twenty one, which it tracks for how I've how I've scored in past rewatches, which is fine. Because this one, in this episode, the ship between Rumple and Bell is called Rumbell. It's not very creative, but it's mm-hmm. it's fine. It's better than anything else we could have used. Fair. I can see how people can begin to ship these characters based solely on this episode. Yeah. It's like what I say about a lot of ships. I get where it comes from. I just know far too much. So I just, it's fine. I It's its good. I like this better than I like other episodes. I think its it moves the plot forward. It's a very good character. It, it's very character driven. Um, for it being kind of a drop in of like, here's Beauty and the Beast. And then we'll go back to other stuff later. It has more, con- it has more consequence without throughout the rest of the show. So it's not quite as episodic as say like the the Hansel and Gretel episode or the Jiminy Cricket yeah. episode where like this, here are characters that like we want to give this fairy tale a try but then you're never seeing these people again like everyone in that in in the flashbacks of that episode you will see again Ooh, I like it so well except for Gaston he changes You'll, okay so you see the character <laughs> you don't you don't see the actor again which is fine yeah um so something that i wrote down from the commentary which made me laugh because especially it's talking about um when they were the, when they were in the bar scene and the the joke of you know cinderella snow white and red Riding could walk into a bar jane said um because they were they're basically thanking abc for letting them kind of take these characters and run with them because they do a lot that they would only be able to do because they're on a disney owned network um yeah. she says we base these fair we base these on fairy tales and for most americans the version they know is the disney version Mm-hmm. I have been saying this on my TikTok account since the start of it that like especially in in justification of there's a musical episode coming in many many years um mm-hmm. and in other things I'm like for a lot of Americans fairy tales mean Disney and Disney means music that's that's the justification I have of like it makes perfect sense this show would have a musical episode but I just went yes I have been saying this I said like the thing of Americans equating fairy tales with Disney. I have been saying this for years and apparently I stole it from Jane Espenson. <laughs> I think that's okay though. Look, if people want to complain yeah. about something that's like based off of a lot of Disney to so to speak, mm-hmm. um has has music, um can we please change our direction to the Grey's Anatomy having a musical episode? But I love the Grey's Anatomy musical episode. I do too. That's the funny part. But it's oh, very okay, good. out of nowhere. I love it. I don't know. I was like, I was thinking, I don't know if we can be friends if you don't like the Grey's Anatomy musical. Oh episode. no, I love it. It's just more of the dynamic of this is literally what this is like. That's meant to have music because that's always yeah. has. This is a show about surgeons that have sex with sexy looking doctors at music, but with a cast that's full of musicians. <laughs> I that is that I just that's why they did it. That is that is why they did it. But it definitely didn't fit <laughs> because they had a Tony award winning actor at the, at the middle of the show. That's why they did a musical episode. <laughs> but you get what I'm saying, like yeah, not the same reasons. I do no, love exactly. it. D- don't get me wrong, I no, love yeah. it. I cry like a baby through it. Oh yeah. I'm so excited for your thoughts on the musical episode. It's end of season six. Like you have a very long oh time God. before you get there. But like the music is cheesy, but like that's kind of the point. Thank you all for listening. Join us next time when we discuss Bob's Burgers season two, episode nine, Beef Squatch.
Don't forget to like, rate, and follow the podcast wherever you listen so you can be notified every time we publish a new episode. And follow us at obdyk underscore pod on Instagram and TikTok. This has been an episode of OK, But Did You Know? A TV and media podcast. It was hosted by Lauren and Katie and edited by Lauren.